the lot of human beings is to till hard land and to, you know, we are cursed unto the 19th generation or something like that uh, by the fall of our first parents. Uh, and we can be redeemed, this is I'm giving you the Christian rap, we can be redeemed through Christ but we don't deserve it. It is if you are saved it is because there is a kind of um, a hand extended to you from a merciful God who is willing to overlook your wormy nature and draw you up in spite of yourself. And this is deep in us, no matter how, uh, you know, whether you're, you may not think you've bought in because you're black or because you're Chinese or something, but it's just in the air we breathe. It's what Western civilization makes you think whether you want to think it or not, you know, even if you don't come out of these traditions. Uh, for us, the concept of that you've got to pay your dues. Human beings are co-partners with deity in the project of being. This is the basis of all magic. You see, in a Christian context, magic is heresy because it implies that that uh, man can command God to act. In other words, that in some strange way the magician compels nature to behave as the magician desires. Uh, in Hermeticism, it isn't so much put in terms of compel, but the idea is that, that uh, humanity, human beings, men and women of great spiritual accomplishment are co-partners in the project of being and that God, as it were, stepped off the stage of creation with it only 90% completed and the rest is left in the hands of his brother. The Hermetica actually refers to humanity as the brother of God. So it's a completely different attitude toward being human. It's an empowering attitude. With power comes the potential to abuse power because you're no longer a worm. You remember that image in Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, where he says you're, you're, you're like a worm suspended over an abyss held there only by the, um, the, the love of a merciful God implying that if he weren't a merciful God, he'd just let go of your thread and you'd go down the tubes. Uh, in the hermetic magical view, human beings are not tainted by original sin. And no, no ideology is without the potential of abuse. Uh, the hermetic attitude in the Renaissance was summed up in a single aphorism by the great uh, Renaissance Platonist Marcello Ficino and what he said was, and I have to, you know, I, I, there's no sexism in all of this, you just have to realize these guys were primitive types and they hadn't confronted uh, the, poli the political issues we've confronted. So when they say man, they mean humanity. The Renaissance magical attitude is summed up in Ficino's aphorism, man is the measure of all things. And this is, uh, this is a double-edged sword because in a single affirmation, you cast off the guilt trip. You cast off the view of ourselves as a flawed creature. But when you say man is the measure of all things, I mean, you could be the chairman of the board of Louisiana Pacific or Dow Chemical. I mean, this is approximately their attitude. 
In other words, it ain't rainforests, it's not the life of the earth, it's none of that malarkey. We are to be the measure of all things. So it has to be tempered. Uh, we'll probably end up talking a bit here about what is about the pathological expression of the hermetic position, which is called Faustianism. And Faustianism is where you have unbridled ego, unbridled faith in the intellect so that you, uh, you proceed forward without self-doubt. If you haven't read Faust recently, uh, it's a surprising read. Uh, first of all, you know, it's very funny. It's hilarious. It's funnier than any of Shakespeare's plays, I think. And uh, the way it ends is in the guy dedicates himself to uh, land reclamation and the draining of swamps to build low-cost housing for poor people. I mean, people don't know this. They, they're they caught up in the images of the center of the story where, you know, magical power is running rampant. But Faust's final conclusion is that he should do some good work for the least of society and give up these uh, Promethean and titanic dreams of... Uh, of the mastery of power. Well, uh, a little bit of history about this hermetic ideal. It's an interesting story in the light of our discussion of time yesterday. Western civilization, in a way, can be thought of as an accumulated series of misunderstandings. And uh, one of the most severe of these misunderstandings has to do with this whole business of Hermeticism. The Renaissance really believed that Hermes Trismegistus was uh, a, a great teacher of antiquity who preceded Moses, who was in time older than Moses. And uh, they, they had what they called um, the Prisci Theologica, the three theologians, and they were Hermes Trismegistus, Moses, and Orpheus, in that order. And uh, the reason that, that I say Western civilization is built on a series of misunderstandings is because they got it all wrong about Hermes Trismegistus, and there was great, uh, conf great uh, confusion and unhappiness in the, uh, in the uh, 16th century when Marie Cassabon, who was an early philologist, attacked the dating of the Hermetic Corpus and argued correctly that this could not possibly have been written in a period preceding Moses. That in fact, this was post-Christian, written no, ear no earlier than the first century AD. This is the equivalent of us finding out that, uh, you know, George Washington was alive in Greenwich Village in the 1930s or something. I mean, it was a completely mind-bending realignment of how people thought the history of the world had unfolded because they had up to that time thought that um, when you studied Hermes Trismegistus, you were reading the oldest philosopher in human history. Actually, it's very late. And in a way, this is what destroyed the magical uh, alternative. The, the advent of modern philology showed that these so-called ancient texts were not ancient at all. They were late Roman. They were Hellenistic. And uh, so strongly uh, was imprinted in the Western mind uh, the what's called, and we've talked about it here this weekend, what's called the nostalgia for paradise. In other words, the belief that the older it is, the better it is. 
and uh, Guillaume Battista Vico in La Ciencia Nuova laid the basis for this kind of thinking. It's called classicism in the Renaissance context. So once they found out that the Hermetic Corpus had been written in, in late Roman times, it was like it was finished. And, and science was able to use the confusion in the magical community at that point to force its own agenda very strongly. And there, were new, there have been numerous episodes of misplaced dating like this that have contributed to the confusion around the history of magic. For example, and I hope this doesn't bring somebody rising out of their chair in an air-clawing rave, but um, <laughs> Rosicrucianism rests on a whole bunch of phony dates because they want to tell you that, that uh, somebody named Christian Rosencrantz wrote a book called The Chemical Wedding and uh, sealed it up in a time capsule in the in the uh, uh, 12th century and that it was then uh, dug up in the uh, 15th, 15th, 16th, dug up in the 16th century. But actually all these Rosicrucian documents were ponied up by people in the 16th century who had a very complicated political agenda which we will probably discuss as part of this uh, this weekend. Uh, hermetic philosophy is based on what is called the Hermetic Corpus. This is a group of books, uh, uh, the most important of which is called the Asclepius. And these books, most of them, were completely lost during the Middle Ages. Uh, at the fall of the Roman Empire, copies of these hermetic manuscripts were systematically destroyed by enthusiastic Christian barbarians. And uh, uh, the, her the hermetic manuscripts were scattered and they only survived then in monasteries in Syria and places like that. Well then in the Renaissance, uh, the Council of Florence, under the patronage of, of uh, the Borgias and people like that, uh, they became very, there was this great interest suddenly in antiquities, because these Roman statuary and stuff was coming out of the ground. So the Council of Florence commissioned a character named Gemistus Pletho to go to Syria and bring back these manuscripts, and they established a translation uh, commission. And they had, in manuscript, the, ma the, the works of Plato, the works of Hermes Trismegistus, uh, a whole bunch of ancient literature. And to show you what the psychology of the Renaissance was, here they had Plato, which they hadn't been able to read for a thousand years, sitting there waiting for translation. And uh, um, the, the uh, uh, Cosimo de Medici said to Marcello Ficino, Plato can wait. Translate the Hermetic Corpus first. And so it was done. If you're interested in, in Renaissance Hermeticism, you can't do better than read uh, Dame Francis Yates' book, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition. Well, I want to read you some of this stuff because uh, it's very interesting and it has a, uh, a modernity that is astonishing. It's also very psychedelic. Um, here's a little passage on, uh, on uh, the imagination. I'm reading from Book 9 of the Corpus Hermeticum in the Scott translation. This is a four volume set. I only brought the text and translation volume, but uh, if you read Greek, it's all here. If you don't, it's all here in English. Uh, but this will just give you a, a feeling for the approach. 
If then you do not make yourself equal to God, you cannot apprehend God, for like is known by like. Leap clear of all that is corporeal and make yourself to a like expanse with that greatness which is beyond all measure. Rise above all time and become eternal, then you will apprehend God. Think that for you too nothing is impossible. Deem that you too are immortal and that you are able to grasp all things in your thought, to know every craft and every science. Find your home in the haunts of every living creature. Make yourself higher than all heights and lower than all depths. Bring together in yourself all opposites of quality, heat and cold, dryness and fluidity. Think that you are everywhere at once, on land, at sea, in heaven. Think that you are not yet begotten, that you are in the womb, that you are young, that you are old, that you have died, that you are in the world beyond the grave. Grasp in your thought all this at once, all times and places, all substances and qualities and magnitudes together. Then you can apprehend God. But if you shut up your soul in your body and abase yourself and say, I know nothing, I can do nothing, I am afraid of earth and sea, I cannot mount to heaven, I know not what I was, nor what I shall be, then what have you to do with God? Your thought can grasp the good if you cleave to the body and are evil. Interesting. Very different from the humble yourself, uh, hard labor, spun wool and watery beer approach of medieval uh, Christianity. Um, here's an amazing passage. Uh, you know, people like to think people thought the world was flat until uh, the Renaissance. Uh, this is a, an incredible psychedelic image of outer space that is second century AD. Would that it were possible for you to grow wings and soar into the air, poised between earth and heaven, you might see the solid earth, the fluid sea and the streaming rivers, the wandering air, the penetrating fire, the courses of the stars, and the swiftness of the movement with which heaven encompasses all. What happiness were that, my son, to see all these borne along with one impulse, and to behold him who is unmoved, moving in all that moves, and him who is hidden, made manifest through his works. And it goes on and on. It's very readable. It's very literary. It's highly poetic. It's a celebration of nature. The notion of sin is completely absent. And it rings with a kind of confidence, a kind of joy that uh, was completely running counter to the brimstone and damnation point of view of Christianity. Here's a, uh, a, a uh, to me, a, a psychedelic passage. But he who presents all things to us through our senses and thereby manifests himself through all things and in all things and especially to those to whom he wills to manifest himself. Begin then, my son Tat, with a prayer to the Lord and Father who alone is good. Pray that you may find favor with him and that one ray of him, if only one, may flash into your mind so that you may have power to grasp in thought that mighty being. For thought alone can see that which is hidden, inasmuch as thought itself is hidden from sight. And if even the thought which is within you is hidden from your sight, how can he, being in himself, be manifest to you through your bodily eyes? But if you have power to see with the eyes of the mind, then, my son, he will manifest himself to you. For the Lord manifests himself ungrudgingly through all the universe, and you can behold God's image with your eyes and lay hold on it with your hands. If you wish to see him, think on the sun, think on the course of the moon, think on the order of the stars. Who is it that maintains that order? The sun is the greatest of the gods in heaven. 
to him as to their king and overlord and all the kings of heaven yield place. And yet this mighty God, greater than earth and sea, submits to having smaller stars circling above him. Who is it then, my son, that he always obeys with reverence and awe? Each of these stars too is confined by measured limits and has an appointed space to range in. Why do not all the stars in heaven run like and equal courses? Who is it that is assigned to each its place and marked out for each the extent of its course? And so forth. So it's a, it's a nature-oriented, celebratory, it glories in the exercise of the mind. It is not doctrinal. It is not uh, pietistic. It is magical, psychedelic, expansive, and I'm not implying that they used psychedelic substances. The evidence for that is incredibly murky and hard to get at, and probably they didn't. I mean, one of the real tragedies of Western history is that Western Europe is so poor in psychoactive plants. I mean, had, had uh, Western Europe stayed in touch with the mystery religions of ancient Greece, Christianity would never have been able to force its agenda to the degree that it did. I think you can make an argument that uh, there were psychedelic mysteries in Europe probably up until the time of the fall of Eleusis. Uh, Hermeticism is only one heterodox strain among many that were in existence in Europe in the late Roman period and that then partially survived into the Dark Ages. I mean, you have uh, Neoplatonism, which is a, a group of philosophers in the, in the third and fourth century who uh, Plotinus, Porphyry, Proclus, and that crowd, and they took Plato, the late Plato, and contorted that into uh, a mystical doctrine of uh, emanation. They were what are called emanationists. What this means is you start with, it's either called the one or the unnameable, or Brahman, Atman, or something like that. And then you have a series of declensions into more and more material and more and more multiplistic expressions of being. These Neoplatonists were emanationists, and their theories about how the universe is constructed have become sort of the unconscious basis of all later magical speculation. Uh, if they are the people who brought the angels into the picture so, so intensely because they were trying to create a descending hierarchy of being from the most high down to the most low. And angels, once set in place, uh, became a real problem for Christianity because they are... Um, not very easy to distinguish from the old stellar demons of the of paganism. Paganism was largely the belief that uh, the power of the stars could be drawn down to earth through a series through sympathetic magic, really, uh, by setting up resonances in a ritual situation. You could draw the power of the stars down into your projects and your intentions. And uh, the late Middle Ages was a period of uh, intensely working out all the associations between uh, minerals, colors, perfumes, plants, musical uh, notes and, uh, uh, you know, styles, so that you could then bring together all these things for purposes of magical evocation. 
And if any of you are interested in this, the, the book to read, which will point you toward many other interesting books, is a, a wonderful book called Spiritual and Demonic Magic from Facino to Campanella. Some of you may remember Campanella. Hell of a fighter. Anyway. Hello? <laughs> And uh, in the Renaissance, you know, over a period of about three generations, uh, this became a real problem because what starts out as angel magic ends up as out-and-out -out demonic conjuration. Something which I've noticed my 14-year-old son has an incredibly unhealthy interest in, uh, which I did as well at his age. I hope it's not the family curse uh, coming back. Um, yeah, so I mentioned the dating error. It was Lactantius, uh, who was one of the fathers of the early church, one of, of the patristic writers. That's that generation of theologians uh, that followed Christ, who canonized the Christian religion. And he placed, uh, he placed Hermes Trismegistus as older than Moses, older than Pythagoras, older than Plato. And, uh, uh, and then it wasn't until uh, Marie Cassabon corrected that problem. See, we forget how the, the really transformative uh, breakthrough that was represented for Western Europe by the recovery of all of this ancient literature. It had been completely lost. Uh, it, it, and also a, a misimpression that probably needs correcting is I think most people who are not schooled in Western history think that the further back in time, the more quote-unquote superstitious people were. This isn't actually the case. It isn't a case of the further back in time you go, the more belief in demons, magical conjuration, and stuff like that you get. Uh, the uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries in Europe were periods of remarkable piety and intellectual cohesion. Of course, it was also some kind of a fascist nightmare. That's how they achieved it. They had stamped out paganism. They had pushed heresy and heterodox thinking to the very distant frontiers of the empire, uh, of the, you know, the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, uh, people were not superstitious and people were not obsessed with horoscopes and conjuration and this sort of thing. Where that all began was, uh, well, or where it reached its culmination is in the 16th century. The 16th century, the 1500s, it was the most magical obsessed century in the last 10. And alchemy, and uh, conjuration, and talismanic magic, and uh, sympathetic magic, all of these things flourished really uh, not as a um, throwback, but as a kind of prelude to modern science. Modern science is an incredibly demonic enterprise. And we will see, as we discuss this stuff, that in a in curious and little, rarely discussed way, the program, uh, the agenda of, of magical dissidents in Europe have been entirely achieved by the forces of what we call modernity. It's simply that it has been done in an entirely secular metaphor. I mean, if you take even the, the trivial belief about alchemists, that they were concerned with changing lead into gold. Of course, that isn't what it was about. But there were plenty of con artists running around on the periphery of these deeper scenes who were claiming they could change lead into gold. Well, in the 20th century, 
We routinely change lead to gold. You do it with neutron bombardment in particle accelerators. And of course, it costs far more to do it than the worth of the gold that you get out. But that really wasn't the point, was it? It was to prove that it could be done. Uh, the dreams of creating the homunculus uh, are dreams that dovetail directly into the aspirations of modern biology, genetics, so forth and so on. Uh, the, the great chain of being of Aristotle is animated, given a dimension of motion, and lo and behold, it becomes the Darwin-Wallace theory of evolution. Uh, the uh, Mersiliad talks about this, about how all the alchemical dreams of the 15th and 16th century have been brought to fruition in the 20th century. But again, in the absence of magical rhetoric, but certainly in a spirit of magical and Faustian recklessness, for sure. I mean, this is scientists, you know, they claim such a devotion to truth that decency must never stand in the way because they serve a higher God than human values. They serve uh, the golem of the truth in some weird way that makes the truth okay even if it kills you. I studied philosophy from Paul Feyerabend and he used to say at the beginning of his Epistemology 101 course, I will teach you to recognize the truth and I will teach you to ask the question, what's so great about it? <laughs> you know, I mean, so now you've got the truth, so what's so great about it? Uh, it was 1460 when these manuscripts were brought to Florence. Those of you with photographic memories can see the time wave signature as it turns over and heads through the floor. Uh, and uh, the um, Cosimo de' Medici immediately ordered Ficino to abandon his work on, Pletho, on uh, Plato. And, uh, and the Pymander, which was one of these uh, uh, books which had been, it was the only one which existed in Europe, uh, even in partial form during the Dark Ages. Uh, uh, Cosimo died in, in 1464, but the translation project uh, went forward and uh, just so you understand that the tree, the developmental process in Western magic goes basically all goes back to this Florentine translation project. And from there, people who were well placed got a hold of this stuff. The most important person probably being uh, uh, a person, certainly an unsung hero in the development of Western thought, Trithemius, Bishop of Sponheim. And Trithemius uh, wrote a book, it was really a manuscript, it was never printed as a book in his lifetime, but later, called the Stenographica. And in it, he put forth many of these magical doctrines and also encryption methods for code making and breaking so that this stuff could be circulated under the eyes of the clergy without uh, causing a problem. And then the, the development of Western magic splits into two strains. Uh, the Bruno strain, Giordano Bruno. I understand he's running for president of the United States this year. Giordano Bruno and his school, he was a Franciscan monk who ended up being burned at the stake, his sin for which he was burned at the stake was he was sitting on a rooftop of one of these Italian city-states one evening, presumably smoking some pretty decent boo that they brought in from North Africa. And uh, he was looking at the stars and he, it occurred to him, these things are suns. These little points of light are like the sun. Jesus Christ! And in a single moment, the universe became infinite. 
And he said, if these are sons, and he just, you know, his mind was boggled, literally. I mean, can you imagine inside the medieval worldview where they have these concentric shells of angels and demons and all this, suddenly this guy gets it in a single moment and he sees that the universe is infinite and he begins to say so. And this is against Aristotle. And uh, the church just goes nuts and they drive him out of Italy and he has a whole bunch of adventures in England and other places. Eventually he makes the mistake of coming back to a place in northern Italy where he's betrayed by his patron and he is uh, he's burned at the stake for a point of view which all of us take quite for granted. The other uh, strain of magic coming down from Trithemius is the D strain. And it is a bit more accessible to people like ourselves because John D was an Englishman and he wrote in English. And so you don't have to conquer uh, 16th century Italian or, uh, or late Latin in order to read him, although he wrote a lot in Latin as well. D is a very interesting character worth spending some time on because D is the last person to be able to unify into one worldview uh, science and mathematics and magic and astrology uh, all together. So he is the greatest magician of his age and the greatest scientist of his age. He designed the navigation instruments that Sir Francis Drake used to go around uh, the, uh, the Cape Horn and sail up the coast of California. He, did, he was a, an intelligence operative serving Queen Elizabeth uh, on the European continent. He could cast the best horoscope in Europe and that was his entree into these various royal families of these various capital cities of Europe. And then he was, you know, making maps of, of battlements and of the deployment of wharf facilities and shipbuilding capacity and stuff like that and sending it all back to Elizabeth uh, in these codes that he had learned from Trithemius, not personally, but from the Stenographica. And D, uh, a very strange incident happened, which was uh, on a cold day in April at his house in Mortlake, which is on the outskirts of London. Now it's completely surrounded by modern London. Uh, I should say he had, he had the largest library in England. He had 6,000 books. Sir Philip Sidney and the Queen would occasionally call upon him to shoot the bull. And uh, he, he was a very learned man. So one day in April of 1582, he's working at his desk at his room in Mortlake, and he goes outside. He's, there's some disturbance in the garden, and he goes outside. And his story, and we have only his story, is that an angel descended in a ball of light and gave him an object which is uh, to this day on exhibit in the British Museum. Uh, if you ever have a chance, it's worth hunting it down. It's in the Renaissance Hall and it's, uh, it's a piece of black polished obsidian uh, roughly about this big and about that thick and very highly polished. It, he called it the Shoe Stone, S-H-E-W. And it, what the deal was was you could look into the Shoe Stone if you had the right talent, and you, it was a magical theater. There were gods and demons and uh, female spirits and all kinds of things swirling around this thing. Well, for the next uh, many years, the showstone was the major guiding force on Dee's life. 
and a guy came to him named Edward Kelly. And Edward Kelly, uh, legend has it that he had no ears, which in England at that time meant that you had committed some infraction in the province and they had removed your ears. It was the mark of a con artist. Uh, was so you couldn't fool anybody else. They took your ears off. So then if you met somebody with no ears and a big scheme, you knew to keep your wallet in your pocket. So, so this guy Kelly had an immense facility with this showstone. I mean, he could just sit down with it. And it is one of the most puzzling and undiscussed episodes in the evolution of Western thought. The straight people just say, whoa, this is a bunch of crap. You know, this guy, Kelly, first of all, Dee was married to a much younger woman named Ann Dee. And at one point in the ten years or so that Dee and Kelly were together, the angels of the showstone uh, gave very explicit instructions that, so this guy was a sharpie for sure. <laughs> However, it's it, it's very puzzling because if he was if he was a con artist, he must have been a con artist of immense uh, cleverness. Because often the way the D angels would work is they would deliver very very long messages in Latin backwards. And Kelly, Kelly would just dictate this stuff at a very rapid speed, and D would write it down, and then they would put away the showstone, and then they would very laboriously rewrite this stuff from back to front, and then there would be long, coherent harangues about what they should be doing, about which courtly figures they should uh, support with money and who should be introduced to who. It was very political, you know. Well, what kind of a polymathic talent was Edward Kelly that he could invert whole pages of Latin and reel it off and then have it be reconstructed and make sense? Also, there are, you see this, we know about this because Dee kept a diary over the years that this was all going on. It's one of the most astonishing books in all of English literature. And until the last 10 years, the 1658 edition was the only edition ever published. Uh, it's called A True and Faithful Relation, or in full, A True and Faithful Relation of what passed for many years between Dr. D and some spirits with annotation by Marie Casabon, the guy who did the correct dating on the Hermetica. Uh, and it, it's very interesting reading. It's, a, as I say, one of the most puzzling instant, uh, incidents in the whole history of science. What D was doing was eventually he came to rest at the court of Rudolf II, Rudolf I of, of Bohemia, who ruled from Prague. Now, you have to understand, is that a hand up? Yeah. yeah. Is there evidence of, uh, of grudges? Not strong enough to, to uh, warrant any getting thrilled about it. Uh, the great awareness of drug use came slightly later, uh, and strangely enough, uh, the drug was opium. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's interesting, the history of opium. You know, we think of, of uh, opium and its derivatives, uh, junk and heroin, as just the lowest, well, maybe crack is now the lowest of the low, but anyway, it's a real scuzzball drug, according to most people's opinion. But did you know that no, they had been using opium for 3,000 years before anybody noticed that it was an addicting drug. It was not ever noted that opium was addicting until 1611 when John Playfair, a very famous English physician, wrote a book in which he commented on opium and said, uh, 
Once one has begun the habit of opium, it must be maintained unto death. Uh, so, uh, in the in the thirty years after D, there was a great hermeticist and alchemical thinker named Paracelsus, who arose on the European continent. Paracelsus is an interesting guy. He's essentially the inventor of drugs because he was the first person to extract herbs and to get this notion of the essence that there's that if you have a medicinal plant then there's something in there which you want to get out and concentrate he called his school of of uh, alchemy iatrochemistry the doctor's chemistry and he invented pills of the ordinary sort and uh, and uh, he said, I have made a great discovery. The center of my alchemical opus rests with the magic of laudanum, which was, of course, gum opium. Uh, there, there was a craze in the late 15th century among alchemists for opium. The, the alchemist von Helmuth, uh, he, he signed some of his alchemical tracts Dr. Opiatus. He, he was uh, the first croaker. <laughs> Somebody had a question? Yeah. The fall of Eleusis. Well, as you all probably know, Eleusis was a cult site near Athens uh, on a plain. There's now a big lumber yard uh, there the last time I was there. But anyway, uh, it was this plain, a very fertile plain outside of ancient Athens, and uh, they celebrated the greatest of the Greek mysteries there. They celebrated, uh, it was a, a biannual, or I mean a twice yearly festival. In the spring, they would celebrate uh, uh, the lesser mystery. And this seemed to be a fairly local uh, get-together of some sort and probably a planting festival. But every September for 2,000 years, people from all over the Greco-Roman world would come for the festival at Eleusis. And the rule was, it, first of all, it was open to everyone. Men, women, free man, slave, everyone could attend. The rule was you could only attend once in your life. And so you had one shot at whatever this thing was, and you were sworn to silence. And literally everyone who was anyone went to Eleusis to experience the mysteries. I mean, Herodotus. Thucydides, Plato, Aeschylus, Euripides, um, everybody. Uh, w people would make journeys of thousands of miles. It was the wellspring of Greek spirituality. The problem is we can't, we don't know with certainty what the excitement was all about. I mean, we know that there was an inner cult area called the Pelisterion and that people would, that something was drunk and that something was seen. And in the 19th century, they just went nuts on this subject. I talk about it in my book. And they finally, all these uh, constipated Victorian classicists decided that the mystery of Eleusis must be a representation of uh, the female genitals illuminated at the height of this ceremony by a laser light show of some sort. And so, you know, it was just absurd. I mean, it was a, a complete distillation of the Victorian mind being projected. I mean, you'd like to believe that the roots of Western civilization are deeper than a peep show, but hey, who knows?
uh, there was a very interesting incident in, it's called uh, the scandal of 415, which is that in 415 BC, a wealthy Athenian noble named Alcibiades uh, was busted for the charge was possessing the Eleusinian mystery and distributing it to guests at dinner. Well, this seems to make it fairly clear that this was not a clay representation of anybody's genitals. Uh, this was some kind of a dope of some sort. So then the scholars whip out their knives and, and all kinds of theories have been brought forward. Uh, some of you may know the, the um, scholar Robert Graves discusses this in The White Goddess. And his theory, which I think deserves to be more, more looked at than it has, his theory was that um, these recipes, if people drank something from a special cup called a kekekion, and uh, recipes supposedly exist for what they drank, and it's honey, barley, something else, and always water. And, and uh, uh, Graves argued that you don't, that water is not something that you list as an ingredient of something you drink. Obviously it has water in it. So he said the inclusion of water in this list is in order that there can be an augum. Do you know what an augum is? And you will when I tell you, because you've all seen them. An augum is when you make a list of things in such a way that the first letters spell out a word. You grok that? So the idea was that in Demotic Greek, the words for barley, honey, water, and this fourth ingredient that I can't remember, those four words can be arranged to spell out the word miko, which means mushroom. So Robert Graves was convinced that a psilocybin mushroom lay behind the Eleusinian mysteries. This is a pretty good, uh, this is uh, not entirely unreasonable. Now, a few years ago, there was a book called, written by uh, the great mushroom enthusiast and discoverer Gordon Wasson and the chemist who discovered LSD, Albert Hoffman, and the classicist uh, Ruck, the three of them, and Jonathan Ott, I think, was also in there, wrote a book called uh, Persephone's Quest. Not Persephone's Quest, that's a different book. The Road to Eleusis. Good. Watch me. Uh, <clears throat> the Road to Eleusis. And they put forth there a new theory, which was that uh, on the plain of Eleusis, they grew uh, barley. And, and uh, these people thought that there may have been a, a special strain of claviceps. Do you all know what claviceps is? Do you all know what ergot is? Ergot is a smut. A smut is a disgusting disease, a fungal disease of grain. Have you ever been in a cornfield and seen an ear of corn that looks like it's covered with some black, slimy, horrible stuff that's flowing out of it and all over it? It's absolutely disgusting. Although, God, in California, I don't know if this is hit here yet, but in California for the past year, the hippest thing that you can be served at pretentious art openings and stuff like that is corn smut, which they spread on crackers. And it's just horrible. And it's really expensive. I mean, it's more expensive than caviar, and it's just become a craze. And I wouldn't get near it. I mean, it's not only disgusting to look at, but the chemistry of it is so weird. God alone, I mean, hives would be the least of your problems. 
anyway, so corn smut, and there are rye smuts, and there are wheat smuts, but interestingly, the, the rye smut, which is ergot, is an, uh, an organism called Claviceps pospoli, uh, produces LSD-like alkaloids. And uh, the problem is that um, LSD ergot-related alkaloids are also uh, very tend to cause convulsions, or they can cause convulsions. If any of you suffer from migraine headaches, now there are a lot of different drugs for migraine. But up until just four or five years ago, the drug of choice for migraine was called ET, ergonomine tartrate. Ergonomine tartrate, if you've got a kilo of it, you can settle down and make several million hits of LSD. Ergonomine tartrate is this very rigidly controlled underground substance that is produced legally only in certain sanctioned fields in northern Pakistan. And it's produced for the world market of migraine sufferers. And you get these little tiny blue pills. I, I have migraines. I used to take or got, but I don't... I've, gotten it under control. But anyway, uh, it's the drug of choice for migraine because it constricts uh, the vessel, the blood arteries going into the head. Anyway, uh, Wasson and Hoffman argued that what they were doing at Eleusis is that they were brewing an ergot beer. They were deliberately gathering barley that was infected with claviceps and they were uh, brewing an intoxicating beer and people were having a hallucinogenic experience. Well now this is a great area for uh, the able-bodied among us to do research because it should be possible to collect uh, claviceps and maybe even to go to Eleusis and collect claviceps there and culture it out and see if you could make an ergot beer that would actually get you hallucinogenically stoned. I'm not sure what's going on. I, uh, ergot is a dangerous substance. Uh, I remember an anecdote once uh, many years ago I knew these people who occasionally dealt illegal substances and uh, one day they they were moving some E.T. to somebody and uh, they asked this guy there if he would take this ounce of E.T. and deliver it to this certain address and they, and they gave it to him and they said now this is E.T. you know so just leave it alone and he got out in the car and he looked he opened up the baggie and it was this white powder and he said you know <laughs> These people can't fool me. So he honked up a little of it. And then he went on his appointed rounds. And, and the guy who was supposed to have the stuff delivered, um, he was sitting in his house. And he heard this commotion on his front porch and opened the door to find this guy flopping around with his legs and feet in the air, having a, a convulsive seizures because of the ET he'd snorted up. It's just one more story about the dangers of white powder drugs, folks. Uh, anyway, I, it's important for the argument because um, I don't see how they could have been serving several thousand people ergotized beer every September for 2,000 years and not had the Ellicinian Mysteries get a certain reputation for risk. You know, that people would have convulsions and conceivably even die of heart attacks. I mean, how could they get that many people loaded year in and year out and not get a bad rap on it? And then I, t I talked to Albert Hoffman about this, and he didn't seem to feel that it was such a problem. He said that what you could do is uh, float hot oil on the surface of this beer and you could draw off the convulsive alkaloids would have an affinity for the hot oil and then you could just skim this oil off and discard it and you would leave the hallucinogenic material in the beer 
well, I haven't tried this, uh, like I say, it's for the able-bodied. But in any case, this was the last outpost in the West of, uh, of uh, psychedelic mystery. And eventually, those enthusiastic Christian barbarians appeared on the scene. In this case, it was Alaric the Visigoth, a great guy to take to an art museum. And, uh, you know, they, they smashed it all to pieces. Alaric the Visigoth was kick-ass. People don't realize that these barbarian invasions of the late Roman Empire, the Vandals took over a huge swath of North Africa. They didn't just stop at the bottom of the boot of Italy or on the Peloponnesian Peninsula. These guys just kept rolling. And huge parts of Africa were under the control of Visigoths and, and uh, Vandals. North Africa, Carthaginian coast of the Mediterranean. And that killed, that was the end of the Illicinian mysteries. Uh, but it shows how late this mystical psychedelic impulse uh, persisted in Western civilization. Uh, see, the thing that gave the Greeks their genius was that it was a mingling of a, of a northern mentality coming out of Thracia and places like that, meeting a very old mystical uh, a feminist culture that had its roots 10,000 years deep in Saharan Africa via Egypt and uh, Chakalya Yuk in Turkey. Uh, because it was said, even in classical times, what is celebrated in secret at Eleusis is celebrated publicly at Knossos uh, in, in Mycenae. You see the Mycen uh, in, in Minoan Crete, you see Minoan civilization was an archaic civilization. It preserved the goddess worship, the opium use, uh, uh, all of these archaic styles were preserved in, in Minoan Crete for millennia after the rule on the coast of Asia Minor was kingship, bronze-tipped spears, city building, and that whole sweat socks mentality that built up there. Uh, and what finished those folks off was around 950 AD, uh, Mycenaean pirates eventually laid siege to these Minoan cities and after centuries of slowly drifting deeper and deeper into opiated decadence, Minoan Crete fell. But all of the mysteries and the mysticism and the orgiastic rites and all of these archaic forms were then imported into Greece as mystery religions, as cult practices. Uh, one of the puzzles of Minoan religion is that they worshipped these things or they had a religious relationship to these things called uh, aniconic pillars, they're called. What they are are mushrooms, as far as I can tell. They built shrines, they worshipped columns, but these columns were slightly flared on the top. If any of you are interested in it, well, something that should be said. See, we have a distorted view of, of how culture developed and what classicism really meant because for the past, throughout the 18th and 19th century, European scholarship spent a huge amount of time it distorting and erasing the debt of Greek civilization to Africa. They, they basically screwed with the record because they just couldn't bring themselves to believe that all this wonderful architecture and proportion and mathematics, that it was little brown people who were responsible for this. And, and if you're interested in this, this book, there's a book by Burnell called Black Athena that is a really radical book. Have any of you read it? It had quite a, it was very controversial a couple of years ago. Great book. Yeah. 
Black Athena by Brunel, and it shows how how Western culture misrepresented the death of classicism to Africa. I mean, they could tolerate the idea of Egypt as long as you always made sure, you know, that these people were white as the driven snow. Well, it's a bunch of malarkey. I mean, it was a, it was a thoroughgoing black culture, and everything was derivative of it right up until I don't know, the Byzantine Empire or something. I mean, Plato freely acknowledged his debt to this stuff. It was just that it was unswallowable to late European culture. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they did a cover thing on it. I, I uh, didn't read it time a few months ago. Yeah, what was it called? Our, Our African Roots or something? Yeah. And there are, it's not, it's no uh, shock and jive. I mean, we think 19th century scholarship was so careful and so wonderful, and what it really was was an old boys club. I mean, they were fast and loose with this stuff. You know, I think when it's all sorted out, it all happened in Africa. I mean, language, religion, symbolic activity, theater, all of this stuff was in place in Africa from, say, 20,000 B.C. up until around 9,000 B.C. in the Saharan grasslands, which then, because of drying, uh, these people were forced into the Nile Valley and uh, into a different cultural style. But uh, the African cradle of civilization, I don't even regard that as a theory. Anybody who doesn't believe that is going to have to do some fast talking. And, you know, there's been this recent effort to say that uh, the Australian Aborigines broke off very, very early. But, um, you know, it's pretty specious, I think. You probably all know the theory of Eve and the fact that you can trace the maternal line through the episome of the mitochondria. So you can actually, it's actually now believed that every human being on earth is descended from one woman. And this woman lived in Africa less than 200,000 years ago. You know, it's really amazing. All other human lines have been quenched somewhere along the line. She was, her progeny were phenomenally successful. And uh, uh, this, this is, I would say now, the strongest theory about this now is the Eve theory. When it was first propounded, it was thought to be screwball, but that's because the physical anthropologist didn't really understand how the molecular geneticists achieved this conclusion. Once it was explained to everybody, it's pretty clear, you know, that, that we are all descended from one single female human being, not that there weren't other human beings that she was embedded in as a society, but none of those lines of descent reach to the present. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it was decadent in the sense that it went into a kind of a deep freeze. The level of change in the last thousand years of Minoan civilization, the dating of ceramic and stuff like that is almost impossible because they were completely static. They were unchanging for a very, very long time in that late phase, and that's when these opium tallies were rising like crazy. Yeah. The Hermetica. They were beginning to uh, invent, in fact, the Casa Bones are considered to be the inventors of modern philology. Oh, is it? Interesting. I wonder if it was a soap job. Uh, yeah, modern philology. 
And the way you do it is by interlocking textual reference and studying locution styles. And it, it was a tremendous shock to the Renaissance when they realized that what they thought was 5,000 years old was less than a thousand, you know, was about a thousand years old. And that's what really discredited that whole worldview, which is in a way silly. Because who cares how old it is? The question is, how much sense does it make? But the Renaissance was so strongly imbued with this uh, belief that the ancient things were the better, that if something was shown to be not as old as previously thought, then it usually went on the discard pile. I think that we lost... Who were they? It was Cosimo de Medici and that family and the Borgias. But you know, this family, there were, I think, 11 popes who bore the name Borgia in a hundred year period. So these people were very, very well connected. They were very wealthy. And they had a disposable income, which was something new in the world. And, and they invented a whole bunch of things which God knows this city lives or dies by. I mean, like connoisseurship, patron of, patronage of the arts, and uh, uh, secular research projects. I mean, they were funding Da Vinci's work on catapults and flying machines at the same time that they were keeping all these painters paid and uh, in mistresses and so forth. They were uh, organizing archaeological digs. People couldn't believe this stuff. I mean, we, we have assimilated all this, but they had forgotten the classical world. And then, and they lived, you know, they lived in places like Rome and Naples and Venice, but they had never dug. And they'd just been quarrying the Colosseum and stuff like that. Well, then when they began bringing this stuff, out of the ground, and then the platonic corpus and all this, they just went ape for classicism. So ape that, you know, now we're this year celebrating the 500th anniversary of Columbus's voyage, which in a sense can be seen as the cherry on the on the top of the Renaissance mental explosion. Uh, we are still living in a classical world. We still react against classicism. The buildings we live in, the clothing we wear, our notion of how gentlemen behave, our attitudes toward women largely, uh, our attitudes towards private wealth, uh, all of this is classicism. And it had been dead 1,200 years before these Italians latched onto it and dusted it off and set it up. And, you know, there had the modernism, in its broadest context, whatever that means, is the first movement to come along to be able to, in any way, challenge classicism. The, the subsets of class, the, the, the art movements and literary movements that preceded modernism were simply aspects of classicism. Romanticism, uh, mannerism, um, the Baroque, all of these are, are like facets of the classical object. It's only in modernism, and what modernism represents, in my humble opinion, is a kind of return to the archaic. Modernism deconstructs the clarity of the Western eye. If you have to date where modernism begins, it begins with Impressionism, which takes the clarity of the Western eye and begins to dissolve it, you know, and the linear you know, the columns and lines, that's how narrative was until James Joyce and, uh, and Henry James and, and people like that showed that narrative could be broken up. Uh, 
Modernism is a form of primitivism, strangely enough. Uh, the people who created modernism, people like Marcel Duchamp and Picasso and the Surrealists, they were tremendously influenced, in the case of Picasso, by African art, masks and sculpture, stuff that had never been seen in Paris in 1905 through 15. And everyone he was tremendously excited by it. So modernism is part of this much larger phenomenon which I call the archaic revival, you know, the discovery of the unconscious through Freud and Jung, the deconstruction of the image, first the image seen through Impressionism, and then the image imagined is deconstructed through um, Surrealism and Dada, and then finally, you know, the concentration on the materials of art, which you get in abstract expressionism where it is about paint it's no longer about paint in the service of of, of uh, the visual pictorialism it just and then all the postmodern stuff which is of course just sort of running naked screaming through the street kind of aesthetic yeah well this thing only this one instance i mentioned the scandal of 415 and this guy alcibiades and he was fined he was fined and given a warning question yeah yeah, the origin, good question. Uh, see, what happened? I mean, it's very interesting. Some of you who are interested in Heidegger may know a wonderful essay by uh, Hans Jonas called The Gnostic Temperament. And what he's saying in there is that the, the um, attitude, the psychology of the late Roman Empire, let's say Rome from A.D. 150 to 400 or so, was strikingly what we would call modern. That, that a, a profound kind of exhaustion entered into the Roman psychology uh, in that late phase. They became, you know, the de a good definition of decadence is it's sophistication without feeling, you know. And it's Camille Paglia's definition, by the way. Uh, and, and the Roman Empire made the emperor a god well, imagine the cynicism that would pervade our society if you were under state order to light candles to George Bush. I mean, you know, we're free to think of the man as a jackass, and it's not heresy. I mean, it may be bad taste, but, or, but it isn't heresy. And uh, the Roman Empire expanded so rapidly and took in so many different kinds of people. I mean, there were, you know, the, the Jews at the end of the Mediterranean, the Parthian Empire had been partially incorporated into the Roman Empire, uh, Egyptian mystery religions and uh, African folk religion, barbarian, Celtic, ideals were being imported in and it just it became uh, uh, and the state religion the religion of the emperor as god was uh, it was fairly tolerant uh, you had to burn a candle to caesar but you could also burn a candle to Asarte and Thoth and Hermes and all these other people. What got the Christians in trouble was they wouldn't they wouldn't uh, give Caesar his due even though it says to do this, you know, they kept claiming uh, that they were had some kind of political agenda. They kept expecting the return of a political figure. The Romans hated that 
because they didn't if they saw it as a political force well in that situation then after you see you have to talk about early Christianity to get this stuff in context uh, people don't understand how shaped our knowledge of the origins of Christianity are with good reason because a religion wants you to believe that it's all very cut and dried there are real mysteries surrounding the birth of Christianity let me just run through it a little bit um, we all know, or so most of us know, if you're not completely secular, uh, the Christmas story. And it begins, and Caesar Augustus decreed that a census should be taken of all the world. And each was going to his village to register. Do you all know this story? And so this explains why a pregnant Galilean woman, nine months pregnant, is 110 miles away from her home village in Jerusalem. We're told that they are obeying the dictates of Caesar Augustus to participate in the census of the empire. And we're told that Pontius Pilate was procurator of Judea at this time. There was no census ordered by Caesar Augustus. No record exists of this anywhere. And if this had happened, it would have been an enormous bureaucratic task involving hundreds of clerks and the coordination of data from all parts of the empire. It would have been a shtick of some sort. And there's nothing, nothing. Only this reference in the story of Christ will you know, weird. Okay, so then you move on. The assumption is that Christ was born in 6 BC uh, under the conjunctio maximus of Jupiter and Saturn. That places, the, if you believe the Gospels, that he was killed at age 33, that means the crucifixion must have been in 27. Well, uh, there is no reference to Christ outside the Gospels until A.D. 71. What was happening between 27 and 71? It's damn near 50 years. And the whole thing falls silent. And then uh, what we get in 71 in, um, I think, the Roman, uh, it's, I guess it's in Suetonius. Suetonius, who was a Roman historian and contemporary, he says in a long rap about something else, he says, Jews have recently come to Rome and uh, caused public disturbances at the behest of their leader, Crispus. This is as close as we get. We don't even know if Crispus is Christ. We just accept that this must be so because Suetonius is telling us that Jews of a religious type come to Rome and cause this agitation. Uh, the, it, some people have even wanted to that, uh, that Christianity was invented in the late 60s and that, the, the, that there never was a person named Christ, that zealots who were preparing the uprising of 69 against the Roman Empire uh, created a mythical figure of a generation earlier and uh, uh, used this mythical figure as a symbol of their rebellion. It would be sort of as if we were to get into Joe Hill. You all know who Joe Hill is? The engine of socialism is a slipping back. Come on all you workers, shovel sand on the track. Joe Hill was a martyr to, to social reform in this country. I believe he was shot by a firing squad in Utah in 1913. Well, we could reach back to Joe Hill and make him the founder of our movement and say what a great guy he was and collect stories about his life and, and it, we could use it to center ourselves and build a kind of social reform movement in the name of Joe Hill. Yeah. The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. 
he basically says something very much like this. Uh, I don't know about that. I just think it's very peculiar that we know so little about Christ when he had such a major role to play. I mean, take a guy like Manai. Manai, the founder of Manism, who was uh, born uh, in, uh, I think, around 320, uh, God, we know everything about Manai. We have his tax returns. I kid you not. We have the guy's tax returns. And we know what he looked like. We know who his friends were. We know he had marital problems. A real person, you know? And yet his religion was stomped into oblivion. So there's something funny about all this. And of course, Christ is no ordinary person. Christ is the third person of the Trinity. God incarnate. This is a claim. This was an idea that had been around for a few hundred years. You, you all have heard of Dionysius, who most people tend to connect to Bacchus, the, the drunken late Roman god of wine. But the early Dionysius is a much, much weirder figure. The early Dionysius uh, is uh, an androgyne, always in the company of women, a god of ecstatic frenzy. And what the enemies of the Dionysian religion always claimed was, first of all, women were the, the major followers of Dionysius, and they would uh, intoxicate themselves in some way, and then holding hands, dance through the countryside and, uh, and uh, rend their clothing and just carry on outrageously. And what the enemies of the Dionysian religion claimed was that they became so frenzied that these women, who were called Manaeids, uh, ate their own children. This was the lie spread about the Dionysian religion. Well, the story of the birth of Dionysius is very interesting because his father was Zeus, the hidden higher all-father, analogous to God the Father in Christianity, but his mother was Simila. And in some versions, Simila is a mortal woman the daughter of King Cadmus of Thebes, but in other words, she's herself some kind of a goddess. Anyway, she was one of these many affairs that Zeus had. He was always impregnating women and, and bearing children. And uh, in the eighth month of her pregnancy, she was struck by lightning and killed. And she was very dear to Zeus. And when he came upon her dead, he immediately performed a caesarean operation and he cut open his thigh and he put the child into his own thigh and laced up the wound and the child was born out of the wound six weeks later. Now, this may be grotesque and peculiar but notice that what we have here is something close to a virgin birth. It's, uh, it's born of the Father, is what we have. And Dionysius was then called the twice-born God, because he was born once by Caesarean section from his mother, and born again six weeks later from the thigh of the father. And it's thought that this Dionysian impulse in the hands of these uh, mystical Jews became then the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception and the whole notion of an immaculately conceived child. Christ is a type of Isis. I mean, it's heresy to say so, but comparative religionists have been saying this for centuries. Um, Dionysius was a religion of, of orgy and ecstasy, typical of this period in Greece. Another religious system that was sort of complementing the Hermetica and developing alongside it was um, Gnosticism. 
and you know, I said a few minutes ago that the psychology of the late West, the Roman Empire, was very modern. Gnosticism is a very, very modern impulse. It may not at first appear so, because ancient Gnosticism is freighted with angels, demons, what we would call superstition. But if you strip away all that Baroque stuff, you come to a philosophy very similar to the philosophy that many of us have accepted really without thinking. We just call it modern attitudes. But the idea in Gnosticism is that you're on your own. You know, there, there ain't no free lunch. If, a God, if God did make the universe, he disappeared shortly afterwards and has no interest in you, your faith, your fears, your hope. Uh, we don't belong. Gnostics were profoundly phobic of the world. And uh, they uh, were either very ascetic cults or they were very uh, libertine-like cults, springing from the same idea, which was that they did not belong in this universe. They were from a different place, and their whole concern was to escape. They are the ones who decided that the earth is an iron prison. Uh, they didn't like to have children because they felt that to have a child is to trap light in matter. The only, in many Gnostic sects, the only forms of sexual activity that they approved of were forms that were guaranteed to not lead to conception. So oral sex, anal sex, whatever, but never sex which could lead to conception because that would trap the light and that was an abomination. Needless to say, these sects died out in a hurry uh, because they were self-limiting. There were all kinds of religious impulses, yeah. Yeah, he, he said that these zealots were using Amanita Muscaria as a sacrament and that Christ was a, was a, a symbol of the mushroom so that they could refer to the mushroom without directly referring to it so that only the believers would know. Uh, I, John Allegro's case is interesting but not entirely persuasive. Um, there needs to be more work in this area. There is something going on in the ancient Middle East about mushrooms. It's hard to reconstruct, first of all, because the climate itself has changed so much that there are no mushrooms. But uh, the, the evidence is pretty strong and getting stronger that, uh, that there was um, mushroom use. I reproduced in my book a picture of a mushroom object and I was hoping I had another one here but I guess I left it back at the apartment. Uh, man, uh, Mandayanism, which is an old, old cult in that part of the world, forbids the use of mushrooms, which is puzzling since there are none. You know, and they don't forbid much, but they go way out of their way to forbid mushrooms. Uh, out of all this turmoil, I mean, it was very much like modern times. The whole Hellenistic world was awash in religious speculation. On every street corner, they were casting horoscopes and prescribing diets. And, you know, there were the, the temple prostitutes. So, so there was the whole uh, hedonic element uh, in sexuality. Orgy was a style in some religious organizations. And uh, out of all of this religious foment, Gnosticism, Hermeticism, Chaldean oracularism, uh, Jewish syncretism, so forth and so on, uh, and Christianity was in there. 
but it was just one in the crowd, but with sharpened elbows and a sense of organization, it was able to slowly worm its way into a position of dominance. The, the real Christians, whatever that means, probably were stamped out under the name of pagans. You see, what happened was the message of Christianity was that the end of the world was imminent. This is the other thing that they were into that has also re-emerged in modern times, is the eminence of the end of the world. And um, so for about 180 years after Christ, or 150 years, everybody just was like so stoned out on this rap that no organ, no serious organization got done and they just waited for the end of the world in little communities practicing voluntary poverty and you know doing their thing and then it began to slowly dawn on people that it had been a long time since the messiah's promise and that it was kind of stretching out a little and so then certain mentalities in that situation said uh, you know, this you know, return of the Messiah is all very well, but I think we should get some real estate under our control and uh, begin a vigorous building program and maybe uh, found some schools and stuff like that. So these religions began to become, to turn away from their end of the world ecstatic millenarianism and to see themselves as organizing for the long haul and um, it was in this atmosphere that the hermetic books were produced and written down the chief magical ritual of hermeticism is the invocation is the ability to call stellar demons down into statues and then these statues prophesy and uh, this is why christianity is uh, it takes the jewish aversion to idol worship and just raises it to a whole new level of intensity because they didn't they were freaked out by this animating of statues with stellar demons thing that the hermeticists were into yeah well, this is a good question, you know. I mean, when you're reading a 1,500-year-old account of a magical invocation, uh, if we are to believe them, what happened was by singing certain songs, burning certain incense, and performing these rituals uh, at certain times that were astrologically correct, they could cause these things called decans, which are, are zodiacal demons of some sort. There are three decans to each zodiacal sign. See, modern astrology has completely, largely forgotten this. I mean, there are people who do deconic astrology, but you have to pay through the nose because, of course, this is a lost and dying art. Uh, but they would somehow be able to draw these decans down into the statue and then they could uh, extract knowledge from the statue. And, uh, you know, th this, is, this would lay the basis for these sympathetic magics which were then later developed in the Renaissance. It's quite powerful, actually. This is why this book I recommended is so interesting, the one on spiritual and demonic magic by Walker, because it, uh, it shows you how by you living a certain life, you know, these Renaissance princes were incredibly wealthy, so you have a suite of apartments which overlook, uh, uh, you know, the Plaza San Marco in Venice, and certain colors are prescribed that the walls be painted. You only wear certain kinds of robes made of certain materials. You perform your magical invocations at certain times of day, burning certain incenses. They were big on fresh air and light.
it isn't the dark image of magic that we get of, you know, the stirring cauldron and the bat-faced familiar and all that. No, it's all about open air, light, wind blowing through, flowing silk robes. It, they were angelic magicians is what they were. And they were evoking these things through the use of sigils, which are magical symbols. And then there became stress on magical alphabets. Enochian is one of these magical alphabets, or languages, rather. John Dee, remember I mentioned the whole 10-year episode with the showstone. Well, one of the subjects which these entities that Dee and Kelly were dealing with returned to again and again and again were um, the, the uh, Enochian this language which they said was the true language that Abraham used to communicate with the angels and it has a special alphabet uh, an alien alphabet and there has even been published an Enochian dictionary of some four or five thousand words uh, it was a very bizarre this is just a footnote but a very bizarre episode in the mid 1950s there was a a woman who was a kind of clairvoyant and uh, she was in contact with flying saucers I mean now everybody and their dog is in contact with flying saucers but at that time it was fairly rare rare enough that she became uh, she became an object of interest to the CIA and at one point she was in the CIA building in Langley, Virginia and they were interviewing her and uh, and uh, she said well there's a there's a flying saucer right outside the window and and these guys rushed to the window and looked and there was some kind of thing in the sky and she said it's it's giving me a message for you for this kernel and, and, and the message was Afa 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 AFFA so he wrote this down well then I I, I don't I didn't read this I looked it up I had a hunch Afa is the Anakian word for nothingness just more more weirdness. Here is uh, the Hermetic creation myth. Uh, this is book three, paragraphs one through a few. And you'll see the comparison, with the similarities to the uh, to the Christian creation myth, but with extraordinary differences. There was darkness in the deep, and water without form, and there was a subtle breath, intelligent, which permeated the things in Chaos with divine power. Then, when all was yet undistinguished and unwrought, there was shed forth holy light, and the elements came into being. All things were divided one from another, and the lighter things were parted off on high, the fire being suspended aloft so that it rose unto the air, and the heavier things sank down, and sand was deposited beneath the watery substance, and the dry land was separated out from the watery substance and became solid, and the fiery substance was articulated with the gods therein, and heaven appeared with its seven spheres, and the gods visible in starry forms with all their constellations, and heaven revolved and began to run its circling course, riding upon the divine air. And each god, by his several power, set forth that which he was bidden to put forth, 
and there came forth four-footed beasts, and creeping things, and fishes, and winged birds, and grass, and every flowering herb, all having seed in them according to their diverse natures, for they generated within themselves the seed by which their races should be renewed. And then it goes on to describe the birth of man. Now, this kind of thinking is what alchemy seized upon in its uh, ambitions. In a way, one way of thinking about uh, what alchemy came to attempt is the thinking went like this. Since man is God's brother, the purpose of man is to intercede in time. And it was believed that ores, precious metals, uh, and things like this grew in the earth. It was a thoroughgoing theory of evolution that reached right down into the organic realm. So it was thought that uh, gold um, deposits in the earth would actually replenish themselves over time. And it's passages like this uh, that give permission for that kind of thinking. In line with that, uh, we're now in book four. And remember, the tone changes slightly from book to book. They were, after all, uh, written over a 300-year period by various people. Um, you must understand, then, that God is pre-existent and ever-existent, ever-existent, and that he alone made all things and created by his will the things that are. And when the Creator had made the ordered universe, He willed to set in order the earth also. He willed to set in order the earth also. And so He sent down man, a mortal creature made in the image of an immortal being, to be an embellishment of the divine body. For it is man's function, here it comes, the purpose of man, for, according to Book 4, for it is man's function to contemplate the works of God, and for this purpose he was made, that he might view the universe with wondering awe and come to know its maker. Man has this advantage over all other living beings, that he possesses mind and speech. Now speech, my son, God imparted to all men, but mind he did not impart to all. Not that he grudged it to any, for the grudging temper does not start from heaven above, but comes from being here below in the souls of those men who are devoid of mind. This introduces the concept of, the, of an elect or a perfecti, a, a hierarchy of human, of human accomplishment and understanding, and this is also basic to Gnosticism. It's not for everyone, they're saying. It's for the pure of heart. And then what pure of heart means depends on the school you're looking at. You know, for some, it was mathematical accomplishment. For others, it was contact with the Logos. For others, it was an ability to resist the temptations of the senses. But there was always this sense of the higher and lower possibility within the human experience. Everybody with me so far? This is at the opening of book 12, and this is a book with a heavy uh, Mandayan sensitivity, this sensitivity to life. Now this whole cosmos, and notice how this transcends even the Buddhist point of view, because in Buddhism plants have no soul. This is a tremendous failure in the Buddhist conception as far as I'm concerned. Uh, okay, this is uh, book, uh, book 12. Now this whole cosmos, which is a great God and an image of him who is greater and is united with him and maintains its order in accordance with that will, is one mass of life and there is not anything in the cosmos, nor has been through all time from the first foundation of the universe, neither in the whole nor among the several things contained in it that is not alive. There is not 
and has never been and never will be in the cosmos anything that it is dead. For it was the Father's will that the cosmos, as long as it exists, should be a living being, and therefore it must needs be a God also. How then, my son, could there be dead things in that which is a God, in that which is an image of the Father, in that which is one mass of life? Deafness is corruption, and corruption is destruction. How then can any part of that which is incorruptible be corrupted, or any part of that which is a God be destroyed? And there are other passages. Um, this is a good one. This is uh, Book 18. For as the sun who nurtures all vegetation also gathers the first fruits of the produce with his rays, as it were with mighty hands, plucking the sweetest odors of the plants, even so we too, having received into our souls, which are plants of heavenly origin, the efflux of God's wisdom must, in return, use his service for all that springs up in us. Now this conception that the human soul is a plant is a, a unique idea. Uh, I don't know of another tradition. Uh, those of you who were with us in Ojai, we heard Johannes Wilber talk about uh, how among the Amazon Indians, the Warao, the men actually marry trees. They actually take trees as their wives. A tree, and it is a man's job throughout his life to take care of this tree with the same tenderness and attention that he lavishes on a living life. This is a more radical conception than that. This is the conception that the most important part of us is a plant. It, it reminds me of the joke that I occasionally make in these groups, uh, the notion that animals are something invented by plants to carry them from place to place. Well, according to this, uh, that's right on. So uh, the, the sensitivity to the vegetative nature of the world is so great that it raises the plant to be the pith essence, the soul of man, the brother of God. So you see the valuation of the vegetative universe here is of an extremely radical type. Yes, Kanon. Um, I was just going to ask if the uh, upper echelon section of the of humanity that was given the mind, was that predetermined at birth or can someone develop the mind? No, it's, it is not predetermined. It is something that is acquired through cultivation of a relationship to, in the hermetic language, nous, the higher mind, and in the Gnostic language, logos, the informing spirit. But yes, no, the whole thrust, yes, and that and the, nothing is predetermined uh, in the hermetic system because through magic we can overcome the energies of cosmic fate. This is the great good news of, of hermeticism, that we are not subject to fate. Uh, we should probably talk a little about this Logos concept. Uh, this is something which seems very alien to modern people unless they are psychedelically sophisticated. The Logos was the sine qua non of Hellenistic religion. And what it was, was an informing voice that spoke in your head or your heart, wherever you want to put it, and it told you the right way to live. You get this idea even in the later Old Testament where uh, it's said that uh, the truth of the heart is, can be known, that, if, that it is no great dilemma to know good from evil. You simply inquire of your heart, is it good or evil? And you will discover a, a voice which will tell you. And, and 
all the great thinkers of this Greco-Hellenistic period uh, sought and cultivated the Logos. Plato had his demon. Everyone sought the informing voice of the noose, that's what it's called in Neoplatonism and then in Hermeticism, I mean, in, and in Hermeticism and then in Gnosticism, the Logos. Now, uh, for modern people, well, no, for me, the only way I've ever had this experience is in the presence of psychedelic substances. And then it is just crystal clear. There is no ambiguity about it. Somehow it's possible for an informing voice to come into cognition that knows more than you do. It is a connection with the collective unconscious, I suppose, that is convivial, conversational, and just talks to you about uh, uh, the nature of being in the world and the nature of your being in the world. Uh, it's puzzling to us because it seems so remote. I mean, for us, a voice in the head or the heart is pathology. And uh, you may know the famous story of, uh, in the first century, uh, some fishermen were off the shore of the island of Argos in the Mediterranean Sea, and they heard a great voice from the sky, and the voice said, Great Pan is dead. Great Pan is dead. Well, people like Lactantius and Eusebius, these patristic fathers, the people who built Christianity, who took the Gospels and turned it into a world religion, they took this annunciation from the sky of the death of Pan as the annunciation of the change of the aeon. In other words, by the aeon, I mean these 2,000 year, roughly 2,000 year periods that are associated with the equinoctial precession. Do you all understand how this works? That over 26,000 years, the heliacal rising of the, of the solstitial sun slips slowly, slowly from one house to another and around AD 100, I mean there's argument because these things are never precise, but around AD 100 the age of Pisces began and the previous aeon ceased and the cosmic machinery, the great gears of the largest scale of the cosmic machinery clicked past a certain point and into the age of Pisces. And this was then taken as um, very fortuitous for Christianity because Christ was associated with the sign of the fish and was seen as a Piscean movement. But I believe that it's entirely possible that the Logos at that moment, that rough moment in time, fell silent and that it has been silent for 2,000 years. And what we have had then is the exegesis of text and, uh, you know, noetic archaeology of the sort we're carrying on here. But that now, in and a phenomenon as, as trivial and, and high-ponted as channeling, can be seen as the reawakening of the Logos. The long night of Piscean silence is ending and the spirit of Nous is again moving in the world, speaking in the minds of the adepts and the hierophants who have uh, the techniques and the will to connect with this stuff. I don't know how I got off on that. But obviously this kind of literature can be seen as the last message from the fading Logos. The, the last statements before uh, the change of the Aeon rendered this control language uh, very difficult and non-intuitive and somewhat incomprehensible. 
This refers to the theme I touched on a little bit last night of the importance of the imagination and how I think that our destiny lies in the imagination. God is ever existent and makes manifest all else, but he himself is hidden because he is ever existent. He manifests all things but is not manifested. He is not himself brought into being in images presented through our senses, but he presents all things to us in such images. It is only things which are brought into being that are presented through sense. Coming into being is nothing else than presentation through sense. This is so thoroughly modern, it's just staggering. I mean, it's for a thousand or fifteen hundred years people couldn't say anything that clearly. It is evident then that he who alone has not come into being cannot be presented through sense, and that being so, he is hidden from our sight. But he presents all things to us through our senses, and thereby manifests himself through all things and in all things, and especially to those whom he wills to manifest himself. For though thought alone can see that which is hidden, inasmuch as thought itself is hidden from sight, and if even the thought which is within you is hidden from your sight, how can he, being in himself, be manifested to you through your bodily eyes? But if you have power to see with the eyes of the mind, then, my son, he will manifest himself to you. For the Lord manifests himself